Hi, you're listening to the Culinary Garden Show. I'm Sarah. And I'm Al. And today we're going to talk about expanding your garden beds or building new garden beds. So it's a time of year when gardeners everywhere are thinking about whether you're a new gardener, if you should put in garden beds, how would you do that? How would you go about it? And if you're already an established gardener, you may be thinking about expanding your current garden beds. Because so, more is always better. It's more, hard to uh, escape that inclination. More is definitely always better. So there are basically two scenarios uh, in this situation, whether you're going to plant directly into the ground or whether you're going to build raised beds. Uh, if you're going to plant directly into the ground, you're either faced with a bare dirt situation or a situation where you have to get rid of some lawn in order to be able to plant. So we'll start by going over these scenarios of planting directly into the ground. We're currently expanding beds in several places. One of the places we're expanding beds is at the community garden. The community garden has a lot of bare earth. Um, we just had an area that was filled in by a contractor with a lot of topsoil. Now, in this situation, we need to amend the soil. Yeah, so what's there right now is the kind of topsoil you would get uh, just as a simple fill, probably better than fill, but there's not a lot of organic material there. You can tell by the color. It's, uh, it doesn't have any like dark, rich colors in it, and it feels very minerally. It, it is red, and it has a lot of clay and sand. And then some sort of small rocks. So that soil needs to be amended before it can be planted, but there's no sense in amending a giant area of bare dirt. You really only need to amend the areas you're going to plant plants into. So the first step is to decide where paths are going to be and where plants are going to be. So in order to do this, we just took some twine and some sticks and we staked off where the paths were going to be and we filled those areas with mulch. Yeah, and you can use a lot of different things for building paths. Uh, mulch, like we just use wood mulch that comes from a local arborist from chipped up trees. That works really well. Uh, you could plant clover or plant ground cover or you could even plant lawn into those areas. Depends on what your goals are. Yeah, if you already have existing lawn and your goal is to put beds in, you just keep the lawn as your paths. Yeah. That way you don't have to lift up too much sod in order to be able to plant. Uh, when it comes to mulch, there are several options, as Sarah mentioned. Um, we use mulch that comes directly from an arborist and it's chipped wood. We used unaged wood chips in our yard and they, we've discovered a tiny little fungus called shotgun fungus. And uh, we'll just let you know about this stuff because it's very strange, but it's a little almost almost invisible to the naked eye. You have to really look for it. It's a little tiny yellow fungus and it shoots a little black spore that will stick to anything basically forever. So we noticed all of these little black specks over the back of our house where we'd put this mulch down and over the windows and over the lawn furniture and the barbecue. And yeah, it's hard to get rid of. So just be cognizant if you're going to use raw wood chips from an arborist, that either you want to age them or you want to keep them away from areas that you don't want little tiny black dots all over. Yeah, that was an interesting discovery last year. But generally that sort of wood mulch is cheaper than buying the bags of dyed wood mulch that you'll find at the home center or the shopping center. And then the other option is to get... Um, an organics company to drop off a load of uh, cedar mulch. Yeah, and those are pretty in inexpensive compared to buying compost or different things. So once you have your paths planned out and you have your beds staked off, the next thing is to start to try to amend that soil. So if you're going to plant into it and you have lawn, the first thing you have to do is you have to remove the grass, which is a pain in the grass. It's true. We've done that a lot at our home garden and it is no fun to dig up lawn, especially if it's an area that's been like established for decades as nothing other than a lawn because the roots go so deep. You have to dig like down like a good foot, foot and a half. And then, you know, you can try and take the soil off the roots, but uh, it, it's really difficult to do. So it's backbreaking labor. So the other thing is to use tricks. One is using machinery. So if you 
have a relationship with a landscaper, they'll come in and they often have a sod removing machine and that will just lift the sod up and leave you with the bare dirt. Um, but then you're removing, like when you have like poor soil that like you would have in a lawn situation and you remove the turf from the top, you're removing any organics that are in that area and you're gonna start with pretty um, barren, like non-fertile soil. So other option is to just of the fungi that reaches all through the soil, uh, pieces of wood that are decomposing, anything that was once alive that's in your soil uh, that is dead or dying or, or actively being a decomposer. So if something has been under your lawn for a long time, there's not a lot of that going on. Like the earthworms and stuff are in that first like five inches of lawn. Uh, and if you remove that, you're removing all of the yeah. All of that little ecosystem. Exactly. Whereas I and think then you have to recreate it. Yeah. And I mean, if you like dig up a piece of lawn and then take all of the, the lawn sod chunks and put them in a pile and leave them there for a year or two years, you're going to end up with actually some half decent soil because uh, it, the lawn will die and then that will all decompose and it will add organic matter because you've got a lot of root mass there. You've got all of the lawn that's green and ripe. I mean, you can use lawn clippings in your, in your garden to amend them. So we know that that's a good thing. So you want to compost them and you can compost them in place basically is what you're doing by sheet mulching or, or putting something on top. So you would build like not a raised bed, but you would just like build layers of material on top of your lawn to suppress and kill the lawn. And if you do this deep enough, you can plant immediately. If you have longer uh, time to do this, generally you would do this in the summer, fall, and plant the following year. Yeah. So when we've added cardboard, I'll often put like leaves on top, um, sometimes put straw on top, put any kind of, uh, any kind of materials that will decompose over time that you might have around might be seaweed. That's a good one to use. Um, and then you want to mix in any compost or topsoil or, uh, you know, material that you have from around your garden. So if you have enough compost that you can add, you know, three or four or five inches to the top of that cardboard, then you can plant into it this year. And just make sure you don't plant anything that's like a deep rooter. But something like, you know, marigolds or head lettuce or uh, just different kinds of flowers, different kinds of uh, simple greens, those would probably work fine. But if you want to actually get down deep into the soil, it's going to take longer. If you're an established gardener, you may have compost around your property already. But if not, you will have to bring this in. Um, they sell compost at the home center, and that's generally pretty good. Sheep manure, or oh, I guess the seaweed compost is compost that they have. Right. So there's seaweed compost and manure. Manure compost? Yeah. Yeah. It's similar, for sure. So you would put bags of that on top, or you would order like a a cubic yard of it from your organic supplier mm -hmm. and then uh, you would plant into that but you wouldn't plant things too deep that's on top there's cardboard underneath that and then your lawn and the cardboard kills your lawn and in the following years you don't have to pull that cardboard up it just disappears no it'll just disappear we've done it in a lot of different areas and occasionally i'll find like a little piece of tape that I forgot to pull off or I'll find one piece of cardboard that maybe was, you know, underneath uh, something and it didn't quite decompose. But otherwise, after I'd say, you know, a winter season uh, and then another couple months, you can put a shovel straight through there into the ground. So save your Amazon boxes. And if you don't have boxes around right now, but you want to start this process, you can generally find cardboard box dumpsters behind certain yeah. kinds of businesses and you can just ask them if they will let you take your cardboard and I'm sure they will because they just have to pay to take it away anyway so if you're in a hurry though what about um 
solarizing. Yeah, solarizing is another approach you can take. And this works better when it's a little bit warmer, when the sun's intensity is really high. And in that case, what you do is you take a piece of clear plastic and you put that over your lawn and you basically bake it. So in the case where you're sheet mulching, you're killing the lawn by by depriving it of sunlight and by keeping it from photosynthesizing. But in the case of solarizing, you're just like cooking it with intense heat. Wow, that sounds Yeah, fantastic. I haven't done it in a while, but now I'm I'm going to do a solarizing experiment. Uh, what about, though, like the microbiome in that situation? Yeah, I mean, I think that in a lot of cases, pe- people have said, like, it'll, you know, it'll fry the worms in the top cup layer and uh, some of the other microbes and, and nematodes and things like that. But I think that they'll move out of the way in general. Yeah, if it's too hot, they might just yeah, go deeper. Exactly. They have a, the ability to move through the soil. But that process is only going to work if it's sunny and warm if it's uh, cold and rainy it's going to take longer than... yeah and, and it's not going to happen like that's not a weekend project either like you're going to probably put a piece of plastic out and wait like a month or more for that to be solarized and we found that uh, when doing these sort of processes where you are converting your lawn by basically denying it of either light or giving it too much light the it often is really good to at least edge around the bed so that you have delineated what you're doing and remove some of the sod manually in that way, even yeah. if you're not moving all, removing all the sod. Yeah, definitely. I usually will remove a, a strip of sod along the edge of the beds that's, you know, maybe six inches wide, something like that. It's pretty easy to remove that much sod with a shovel. And then actually I'll often use those pieces of sod just to hold down the cardboard because that's another thing. We live in a fairly windy place and, you know, you can spend an afternoon putting down nice pieces of cardboard overlapping and putting some straw and leaves on top that might all end up in the neighbor's yard the next day. And then once that cardboard is kind of killed off the, the lawn and you've got your layers on top of it, some people call it lasagna gardening, but mm-hmm. you're basically just building layers of like maybe some straw and some, and straw and hay are the same thing. Hay generally is full of seeds and straw should have fewer seeds. So um, straw is the way to go. So you might have straw and compost and some soil and those things. And then when you do want to go dig, uh, and, and, and and plant something, you dig the hole for whatever you're planting, you can cut through that cardboard um, and through the dead grass, and then you might want to amend that with a little compost deeper down and then plant, and then eventually over time, over a few years, uh, everything is going to kind of equal out, right? Yeah, it's amazing. And then you can also use different um, techniques like broad forks uh, to like aerate, but people are generally not tilling as much. So no till is a movement these days where you basically sort of try to keep the layers intact. Yeah, it's it's an approach where uh, in farming, but also in gardening, where instead of uh, every year digging up your soil, so taking a shovel to say the, the patch of bare earth that you have uh, or that we have at the community garden and then turning that soil over, there's even a method called double digging that's like commonly taught in garden workshops where you, you dig to the depth of one shovel and then actually another shovel just to get all the way down there. Um, instead of doing that, you basically just build on top and you just let all of the microbes and all of the amazing things that happen in the soil happen and incorporate that organic matter that you put on top into the soil below. And the way that a broad fork works is pretty cool. You can you don't need a broad fork. You can just use a plain old garden fork, but you just basically stab it straight into the soil and just gently rock it back and forth, sort of like you would aer- aerate a lawn in some cases where you're just basically making holes And those holes are just creating air pockets and pockets for water and spaces where uh, different kinds of the organic matter on top can fall through. And it's just sort of loosening up the soil underneath instead of actually digging it. Another cool way to add nutrients and do sort of a similar thing is with living green manures. Yeah. Yeah. So you plant something like a daikon, which can be... Oh, they can, we've had them before that were like three or four feet long and they dig way down into the soil and then you don't pull them up. You just leave them in there. They decompose and they uh, create like a channel for um, the biome to move down deeper into the soil. Yeah. Again, it's like you're basically building a compost heap in your garden bed, if you think about it that way. So that's scenario number one. If you're planting in and on the ground, uh, 
you want to plan out, you want to delineate your paths from your gardening area, you want to kill off your lawn, and then you want to add layers on top of the dirt in order to create a biological system that's better for planting in. Yeah. It might take a few years for that to happen, but you can start planting pretty much right away if you get yeah. rid of that. And, and what's great about that approach is that you're using what you already have in there in terms of soil and in terms of uh, just adding different kinds of organic matter. So it's sort of more of a, can be a long-term approach, but it's uh, involves bringing in less material. It's slower and yeah, but it, you're using what mostly what you have around. So the second option is to build raised beds, either on the dirt that you have or on your current existing lawn. Um, you still need to plan so you know where your paths are going to be and the orientation of your raised beds. And then you have to choose a material uh, to build your raised beds out of. Uh, this can often be wood or it can be treated wood or it can be corrugated metal is pretty popular or some kind of masonry like bricks or interlocking landscape pavers. Um, if you have to um, create beds that sort of match odd angles or things like that, then you probably want to go with wood. Um, when you buy kits, you are often limited uh, by the manufacturer's specifications as to how high they are. Keep in mind, if you buy a very tall planter um, or raised bed, like a corrugated metal one that you see all over social media these days, it's going to take a lot of material to fill it up. Yeah, like a huge amount of material. I mean, even if you're adding things like uh, wood and straw and leaves and some of the organic materials we were talking about earlier to the bottom, like those are going to sink right down as they decompose and you're just going to have to keep topping it up like actively with a lot of soil. So if you choose wood, you can often uh, go to the, the lumber mart and pick the, you know, the dimensions of lumber that you want. Uh, wood is a good, easy to work with material. It's very um, available in the area where we are. Uh, generally, you can order just uh, spruce wood, which is untreated. It will last anywhere from three to maybe seven years, depending on how wet uh, your conditions are and how much airflow there is. You can use treated lumber. In the past, treated lumber wasn't recommended because it was um, up until the early 2000s, it was treated with arsenic and arsenic concentrations are bad for humans uh, to consume and also to work with and dispose of the wood. But now uh, the tre treated wood is treated with copper, uh, the same copper that uh, your water pipes are made out of and um, other things around your house. Um, so it's considered safe. Uh, you still want to have some precautions when you're uh, using that material, when you're cutting it and disposing of it. Uh, you don't want a lot, of, a lot of dust getting into your, your face or anything like that. So um, some precautions are necessary, but it's considered uh, safe uh, to use as planters. And then there are odd woods like cedars and hemlock and tamarack that you can maybe find at a local mill that will last longer than spruce, but not as long as the treated wood. The treated wood, if it's if it's uh, rated for ground contact, is good for 25 years. It's guaranteed. Whereas the untreated spruce would be good for, we would like we said, two to five years. Uh, maybe you get longer into that, and then somewhere in the middle is the hemlock and tamarack and cedars. So it just depends on how often you want to change your beds out and what your conditions are. Yeah. Uh, in in the beginning, we built a lot of beds just out of scrap spruce untreated wood that we had around from different construction projects. And it was great, but they definitely fell apart pretty actively within a few years. Yeah. And if you're using scrap wood, like in, you know, you could use pallets, but pallets are also treated. So you have to make sure you don't use pallets that were treated with chemicals. Um, so there's uh, usually a stamp on the side of pallet wood that says how it was treated. But if you're mixing and matching woods from all over the place, you may end up putting a critical structural piece made out of a piece of wood that rots really, really fast. And then your whole bed is kind yeah. of uh, in jeopardy. And, of and it's a great way to get started and do something that's really inexpensive and easy. But and once your garden is planned out, like then it's time to like go from scrappy wood to like more permanent things like... I guess I ending up at like masonry, which is like time consuming and uh, is long term, but it uh, 
So beautiful. It is beautiful, but you generally, if you're going to do things with masonry, you have to build a, you have to deal with frost issues and you have to build a footing. And so like, it's a lot of effort uh, and money to do that. And then somewhere in there is the new uh, fad or trend of using corrugated metal, which is steel that is uh, treated with zinc. So it's galvanized. Zinc has uh, some of the same sort of like properties as copper where it's an essential mineral for humans to consume uh, we need it but too much is a bad thing so you have to be careful uh, with getting zinc on you and in the garden but generally a lot of these products are also treated um, by uh, coated with uh, some sort of a polymer or plastic which is another thing is like you can also get raised beds that are made out of some sort of plastic um, people are concerned these days about microplastics, so much plastics in gardening from the little seed trays that you start the year with to, um, different tools and plastics for greenhouses and it's everywhere. But if you're trying to minimize it, like using plastic raised beds is probably not the way to go. And plastic gets really brittle in the winter. So, uh, I'm not sure if our climate is good for plastic raised beds. Yeah. I haven't seen anybody using them locally, but... Yeah, there's a lot of different options out there, and I think it's just about what fits what you needs. want and what fits your needs, and you know your timeline on your garden and where you are and what you're doing. So now that you have chosen the material that you're going to build or purchase your uh, raised beds uh, made out of, you will have planned out where you're going to put it on your lawn, and then what do you do now, like? Do you have to remove that grass that you're going to put it on or should you put a layer in there? I, I would say like putting a layer of cardboard in there just to make sure that the lawn gets killed is not a bad idea. And, you know, cardboard's just like a natural material, so it'll decompose uh, pretty easily. And yeah, if you have a patch of something that's maybe more of a bit of a tenacious weed that is around and you don't pull them up first, then I would say even using something like a landscape textile is probably a good idea. Like we planted a raised bed over some mint. They totally came up through, you know, a foot and a half of, of new soil. So we had to take it apart and move it out of the way, empty it, put down something to act as a barrier and then put it back. So it was work we didn't really want to do. We should have just done that in the first place, knowing that the mint would likely come up. So if you have weed problems like those, then uh, put down something more serious or put down a lot of different layers. Uh, but if it's just the lawn, then just kill it the same way you would with sheet mulching. And then you have to fill these beds up. And some of these beds can be quite large. If you have a three foot bed, you know, uh, three foot tall by five, but you know, you're looking at like 45 yeah. cubic feet, yeah. something when, like that. When we just built the beds uh, in the backyard and we built them out of the, the treated lumber, we actually dug them a little bit into the soil. So we built them over areas that were in ground beds before. So that was a good process just to make sure that they're established in place, uh, that there's not going to be any soil washing underneath them. Uh, and then also they're level, so they look nice and they uh, sit well in the, in the landscape. Um, and that process, because we were digging, ended up filling the garden beds about halfway with soil from the yard. So that was actually good because we didn't have to add as much. And we had some uh, purposely rotting hay around or purposely rotting straw, actually. Um, so we could put some of that in. We had a couple buckets of coffee grinds just because we have an espresso machine and we save those things up. So we bought some sheet manure and we also bought some bags of like, I don't know, the PC all-purpose soil that seems like it's mostly peat moss, uh, but is pretty nice. Peat is a good substance to add to your beds, uh, especially if they're getting started. It's very like light and airy. Uh, and if it's something where your beds are sort of more minerally and have less organic matter, it'll really uh, give the seeds something to, to get started in. It also holds water really, really well. There is a movement in places like the UK to move away from using peat uh, because of the practices that are used in peat bogs in those places. Here, uh, seems like some of the issues around peat bogs that they have there don't exist as badly. We produced a lot of peat in New Brunswick, so it's not coming from particularly far away. 
And we use a minimal amount. I think that where peat becomes a problem is in large yeah. applications. Yeah, I mean, the landscape industry and like the nursery industry uses a huge amount of peat moss. You basically have to think about when you're buying your raised beds, uh, what you're going to fill it with before you get it in too far. Um, it can be quite expensive. There are, uh, you'll find on uh, YouTube and places like that, uh, information about using old cordwood and things like that at the bottom to sort of fill it up at the beginning. That's a good strategy. They're going to use a lot of nitrogen and maybe take some of it away from the soil, but eventually as they break down, they'll release it back into the soil of your bed. Uh, but one thing you will find is that year over year, every year you're going to sink, you know, four, six, eight inches, and you're going to have to add material back on top. But it's a good way to like spread out the cost of filling that bed. Definitely. Top, topping it up every year, like even just what we did wasn't, you know, very expensive compared to, you know, it cost maybe, I think it was $20 per bed that I topped it up with material. So that's reasonable as opposed to like, if you were going to fill that bed from the ground up, uh, 12 inches would be like a couple of hundred dollars. Yes. Gardening isn't super expensive, but it's also like building beds is not free. It can be uh, with a lot of effort, yeah. but it can also cost money. But in the long term, it's cheaper than buying from the grocery store. And it's an enjoyable activity as well. So for sure, it can't be all about economics. So good luck with your garden beds, building or expanding. It's a great time of year and then they get to get planted. So you're listening to the Culinary Garden Show. We're on CHMA 106.9 FM, the voice of the marshes in Sackville, New Brunswick. CKDU 88.1 FM in Halifax. On Apple Podcasts. And YouTube as the Culinary Garden.